So we've now entered the second half of the book of Mark, and now he's focused on what kind of Messiah Jesus will be, and if the disciples are willing to follow him. He has told them that the Messiah is supposed to suffer and to be rejected by the religious leaders, by the teachers of the law. And this is something that Peter was not very happy about, you remember. And But Jesus told Peter that he was thinking with human thinking and not the way God thinks. And so uh, he also said that some of those who were there would see his kingdom come in power, which I argue is a reference to the resurrection, although he did also reference the last day, the day of the Lord in that passage. Now, here we have a rare thing that happens in the book of Mark. Mark gives a specific amount of time in between events. Usually he just says things like immediately or sometime later, and now he says specifically six days later. This is important. It's meant to make us think of something. Well, when you look at the story, I think it's made to make us think of Moses on Mount Sinai because Moses went through six days of purification before he could go up onto the mountain and meet with God. And so six days after confessing Jesus as the Messiah, three of the disciples will go up on the mountain with Jesus for an encounter where they're going to hear the voice of God. So let's read the passage. It says in Mark 9 verses 2 through 13, after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen, until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept the matter to themselves, discussing what rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, Why do the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, To be sure, Elijah does come first, and restores all things. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer and be rejected? But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wished just as it is written about him. And so I mentioned that Mark wants us to think of Moses on Mount Sinai. And there are actually a number of parallels between this story and that event in Exodus 24. Like, Jesus is radiant. Moses was radiant when he came down off the mountain. God appears veiled in a cloud in both stories. God's voice speaks from a cloud in both stories. So there's a few comparisons here. And and we're seeing a connection between the Old and New Testaments. And the Old Covenant was established through Moses on Mount Sinai. And so this may be a picture to the disciples that Jesus is the mediator of the New Covenant, which is also prophesied in the Old Testament. So they would have had some idea of a New Covenant coming. And so seeing this idea of going up on the mountain like Moses might have made them think of the New Covenant with Jesus being the mediator. Uh, Peter, James, and John, they go up with Jesus onto the mountain. They're sort of his inner circle. They get to see things that the others don't get to do. Like they got to go in when he raised the little girl from the dead. The others didn't. And now they see Jesus transformed. And all of a sudden, there he is talking to Moses and Elijah. How did they know it was Moses and Elijah? No idea. But they knew. They knew who it was. Uh, and in the previous passage, they had talked about Elijah. And like we said, the mountain motif is meant to invoke Moses. So it kind of makes sense that these are the two Old Testament figures that would show up because of the way these stories are working. Now, some have said that uh, they see these two because Moses is the representative of the law and Elijah is the representative of the prophets. And this makes sense. Uh, but also the Jewish uh, readers would recognize a connection uh, to Malachi chapter 4, verses through 4 through 6 
which speaks of the redemption of Israel. And two figures are in that story. You guessed it, Elijah and Moses. Uh, so we, we know that they are even thinking of this passage because the disciples asked Jesus about it. When they say, why do they say that Elijah has to come first? They're actually asking him about Malachi 4, 4 through 6, that says, Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. So they're referencing this passage. And as they come off the mountain, Jesus says, yeah, Elijah has already come. And it's clear that he's talking about John the Baptist and what has happened to him. So they were up on the mountain and the voice of God has told the disciples to listen to Jesus. And Jesus uses this opportunity to tell them that the scriptures have said that the Son of Man will suffer and be rejected. You saw that because he said, why do the scriptures say this? And so he's letting them know that, again, he's going to suffer and he's telling them that it comes from the scriptures. But my favorite part of this entire story is Peter's reaction. I, I can totally see myself in it because Peter, he's still thinking in a completely human way. He, uh, he doesn't know what to say, so he says something dumb. He says something stupid. Have you ever done that? I certainly have. And he, he doesn't know what to say because he's afraid. So he's up there and he's like, whoa, all this crazy stuff. And he just doesn't know what to say. <laughs> so he says something dumb. So I think that um, we don't need to make too much out of what, what, what do these shelters mean? You know, does he trying to imply creating like, different no I, I don't think we want to take too much into that because mark makes a point to tell us that peter didn't know what he was talking about so don't really listen to him too much here but i think that what we see here is that peter's reaction is that i want to build these shelters for you is the idea of like they the jewish uh had the jews had a festival of shelters where they would go out and stay in shelters they still do this today there's still some jews who do this uh, ben Shapiro is one of them. His family does this. They go out and build a shelter and stay in it for, for a while. Um, and it's part of their Hebrew history. So I think that kind of the idea here is that Peter is talking about, hey, Jesus, let's build some shelters and let's camp here. This is where we ought to stay, right? Like, this is pretty awesome. You know, here's Jesus radiating in glory. Moses and Elijah are here. Let's stay here. And... Um, it's kind of this idea of like, yeah, this is what we want. Well, let's let's not let's not do that suffering stuff. Let's let's park it right here where things are good. And I think that's our human tendency is that we just want to stay in the glory. Uh, Petra has a classic song called Beyond Belief, one of their most famous albums, and a line in the song says, "We're content to pitch our tents." where the glory is evident. And I think this describes Peter. I think it describes us. He's afraid, yeah, but he wants to stay there in the glory of the mountaintop experience. I mean, don't we all? Mountaintop experiences are great, but eventually we have to come down from the mountain and face reality. And the mountaintop, we all have these mountaintop experiences. They show us a glimpse of God's glory. But the reality of spiritual life takes place on the journey in between, where you go through suffering, where you go through difficulties. So getting a glimpse of God's glory on the mountaintop is great because it gives us hope. But for now, we have to keep walking through on the journey of rejection and suffering the way of the cross. Have a great week. God bless you.